Now, without transition, let's immediately go to our opening panel, which is about what can research policy do to support science for policy. And in a way, if you want, we're going full circle, because the question is better policy for better research for better policy. But behind this sort of bumper sticker slogan, there's, of course, better research policy to do better applicable science in order to come to better overall policy. That is pretty much what it will be about. It's about how we can craft better policies to improve the uptake of science and policy. And to explore questions, we have these questions. We have a panel packed full of people overseeing research in EU member states or at the EU level. So we have one person who in our preparation calls left no doubt that better research can make a better science uptake in policy. The head of the European Semester and Country Intelligence Unit, Unit at the European Commission Directorate General for Research and Innovation and the Deputy Director of the Directorate for the European Research Area and Innovation. Please give a very warm welcome to Magda De Carli. Magda, welcome. Now, you might have noticed already yesterday, I always ask people for their sort of side occupations. And I have one person to announce who has a very remarkable hobby, if I may say, a specialist in e-voting and election observer in her spare time and in her day job, the head of the Department Europe and International as well as Societal Impact and Open Science at the Directorate Research and Science Policy of the Dutch Ministry of Education, Culture and Science. Please welcome Susanne Karls. Welcome, good to have you here. And we have a political scientist slash anthropologist venturing into the world of science, a specialist on migration and otherness, which comes in handy if we talk about bringing these two worlds together, science and policy making, which oftentimes perceive each other as other worlds. The Vice President for International Affairs of the Spanish National Research Council, please welcome Javier Moreno Fuentes. <laughs> Javier, good to have you. And last, but definitely not least, we have a former minister among us, and on top of this, a minister of research. Somebody whose CV indicates pretty much an insight as deep as it gets, into both worlds, that of science and that of policy making. A field professor in industrial bioengineering and biorobotics, then rector of a university, the youngest one in Italy at that time, later an MP, then the Minister of Education, University and Research, and today the president of the Italian National Research Council. Please welcome Maria Chiara Carozza. <laughs> Maria Chiara, great to have you. Now, I wanted to kick off this debate with a broad question, sort of what can research policy do to support science for policy? But in order to know you a little bit better and what you're currently busy with, I, I would like to break this down a little bit to the more narrow focus of what does research policy already currently, right now, to support better uptake, better uptake of science in the process of policy making? And perhaps from your current experience at the National Research Council in Italy, Maria Chiara, but feel free also to draw from your experience as a minister, of course, what can and what does research policy already do for a better uptake of science? And uh, in the world or in Italy? <laughs> in Italy, in, w w in within the, the field okay. you're working on. So good morning, everybody. Um, I think that... Uh, uh, today, as uh, it was already pointed out, we have many uh, trends for our world, uh, which are a sort of a threat and uh, reminding us that uh, in future the climate change, the need for energy, the issue of water, the issue, the issue of food for everybody 
is something which is uh, related to science, but also is something which is related to the future of the world as we know to today. So uh, we know that the relationship between uh, human being, humankind, and uh, the planet is uh, in danger, okay? So the, the planet will survive for sure. What we don't know is if our society can survive with these conditions. So I think that we scientists are called for contributing in uh, trying to make uh, informed opinion, evidence-based position papers on the situation that we are facing. And uh, we have to provide policymakers, but also citizens, uh, this kind of communication and information. And uh, what we are doing today, for example, in practice, how we can do that, where this uh, science advisor system is not in place with a formal uh, methodology, and this is, uh, I think, a problem. We have to develop this uh, shared methodology in order to develop this methodology everywhere. We can uh, act in uh, parliament hearings, for example, or in expressing position papers, in developing academies. For example, in Italy, uh, we are developing an academy of engineering exactly for doing that in the area of technologies and uh, in the area of raw materials and circular economy. So developing all methods in order to establish these relations between evidence-based uh, science and opinions and positions and the society. I think that it is not sufficient to make this dialogue with governments or uh, policymakers, but we have to distribute and disseminate these positions. For example, in Italy, everywhere in, in, in Europe, uh, hearings in the parliament are public, so we can use the information, the hearings as uh, systems for support this dissemination. So it's important to engage citizens in this. So I think that also citizen science must be part of this equation. Thank you very much. Javier, I think the Research Council in Spain is undergoing a little bit of a restructuring currently. I think the microphones are all directed by the technicians. You don't have to do anything. Um, it, perhaps a few words on how, how the restructuring is going, where is it heading, and how big the, how, how big a role does the, the attempt to improve the role of science in policy making okay, play there? Thank you, Olaf, and thank you for the, to the organizers for the invitation uh, to be here today. Uh, to your question, uh, straightforward, uh, the SIG is a very large organization. It's actually the largest scientific organization in Spain. We have about 14,000 people working, of which two-thirds are actually either scientists or technicians helping to develop research. So, of course, its main concern is research and the pursuit of knowledge, right? That is uh, something we have always done for a century. Uh, when the current uh, presidential team, uh, I'm part of the group that is leading the organization for a little bit more than a year now, uh, arrive, uh, what we realize uh, is that within CSIC, most or a big, la a big number of our researchers has been involved in one way or another in uh, providing scientific evidence to policymakers in different levels. But this was not something that was visible. May I just interrupt? Did, did this come as a surprise? Uh, no, no, because I'm a scientist okay. within the organization, so I've been there for more than 20 years. I know that whatever, whatever I have done in this field yeah. is something I've done let's say because of my own personal interests or vocation, but the organization didn't ask me to do anything. Uh, if something, it would actually look at it with a little bit of suspicion. Why are you away from what is your main purpose, which is publishing uh, articles in top journals? And this is uh, back to the question you asked to Maria Chiara. What can we do from when we think about um, policies to support research, what can we do? What we can do to support science for policy is to value it, uh, to recognize that within the trajectory and the career of a scientist, whatever the scientist can do to support science for policy is something that adds. Of course, it, doesn't, it shouldn't take anything away from articles and, and obtaining funds and so on. Of course, that is a given, you know, that's the central 
There is no question about that. But whatever you do that, in a way, makes available uh, scientific evidence to policymakers should be something also taken into consideration. And when, I, when we arrive, what we realize is that something, this was something that was kind of, if not hidden, at least ignored by the organization. So the first thing we're doing is to visibilize the work that our scientists do that can be helpful to inform policymakers. And that simply, putting this on top of the table, has meant, in my opinion, a very significant change in the way in which the organization deals with uh, this type of knowledge, right? Uh, we have done other things, of course, other than visibilizing it. We have set up a, a, a line of work within the organization in which we ask our scientists, what can you contribute to address a societal challenge, which is, which is at the same time a scientific uh, question, right? And we have put our scientists, uh, and again, as I was saying earlier, we are present in all fields of science, so we have asked them, what can you contribute to address this societal challenge, and how can you provide uh, some sort of recommendations to policymakers on this field? And I can go back to that. I don't want to monopolize the... We, we, we will come to this later. So, Susanna, I think the Netherlands are quite unique in the number of advisory councils that there is, but also for the political prominence, really, so, a sort of double question. Is that part of the, the Dutch Polder model, which was always about bringing in all the different perspectives? And could you explain how the advisory council landscape, if I may phrase it that way, works in the Netherlands? Sure, thank you. Um, also, from my side, uh, thank you for the organizers for organizing this event. I think it's a very important topic. Um, um, and like in the Netherlands, what we have is we have a what we like a rich landscape of of planning bureaus and and uh, research institutes that advise the government on all kind of matters. Um, they do that asked, but also not asked. Um, uh, and one of the things, for example, what they do is like we have elections coming up at, in uh, the end of November, uh, so they uh, they uh, they look at the programs of the political parties if the political parties ask them. Currently, we also have a few parties that refuse to do that, uh, but to see if that's, if that's economically and financially uh, 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 sustainable, uh, the program that they put forward. Um, also, what we have is like, where we, uh, we have, of course, the, the ministerial council that meets every week, um, but we also have sub-councils that prepares that, that the ministerial council, and the planning bureaus have a seat in the sub-councils. Um, <clears throat> so they, and that way, they, that, in that sense, they are, they are involved. Um, does that mean that we uh, that we are on the right? I mean, I think we're on the right track, but do we have a perfect uh, uh, situation yet? Of no, of course not. Um, um, so we're also what you're saying about like making it rewardable for the scientists to also invest in 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 seeing how uh, it can um, in provide input for for policy making. That's also something that we're also looking at in the Netherlands. Uh, we have a program, it's called um, uh, 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 Recognizing and Rewarding, and it looks at the broader sense that scientists, you know, it, <clears throat> it does not only look at the citations, but it should also look at teamwork, education, and also especially uh, this part. Th thank you, thank you very much. I, I think no, nobody has ever reached the ideal state, but I think the purpose of this entire conference, not only this panel, is actually how, how do we do to make further steps in that direction. And now it comes really as a total coincidence. I haven't asked you, the speakers, to sit down, but after the row of member states, bam, we come to the European level. Magda, um, well, one, one part of the question, I guess, is what's going on in Brussels to improve the, the uptake of science and policy making, but you also, because you are here with the double hat um, of two functions, you wanted to draw from the European experience, from the European research area, right? No, for sure. Thanks, Olaf, and thanks to all the speakers already for the very insightful uh, contribution already. And it's very nice to see that there is movement from the research side and the member state side already. And a lot of movement is happening as well at the level of the, of the Commission. Um, and sure. the idea is, in fact, uh, from the Commission side, to make all these initiatives that we have heard the kind of spontaneous, becoming more systematic, to create really the framework conditions for those type of initiatives to become the norm and not just exceptions. Um, so there is a lot of debate going on, uh, and I think is uh, uh, since 
2022 in particular, there has been a particular attention to science for policy, and probably we know why as well. Eh? It has become really important to, to show, uh, and it was evident, uh, the importance of uh, scientific evidence for policy making. Uh, in 2022, we had the Commission uh, uh, staff working document that was really addressing how to best uh, create uh, science and have a science for, uh, for policies. And this was then followed up by a, a minister's uh, debate in 2022 in December. And uh, this was followed by, in 2023, by a discussion at the ERAC meeting. So you see, it's really the member states and the scientific communities starting discussing this, uh, these things. And uh, in the June 2023 uh, discussion, already they came to quite important uh, uh, conclusion on the way forward. Uh, they were mentioning, for instance, the importance of development of a European uh, science for policy ecosystem, uh, the idea of creating a network of science for policy coordinators, the importance, as Mario said, of sharing and exploiting existing knowledge, and we have seen already that it's not only RTD doing uh, working on that, but JRC, and we are strongly collaborating with DG Reform as well, as Mark, Ma Mario said before. Um, so the importance of the division of roles, uh, the importance of showing that the research needs to be excellent, there is ba basic research as well, uh, and then this uh, science for policy activities needs to be funded. So what are the, all this uh, conclusion of the discussion are bringing now, and this is what we are busy now, and I have here my hat as uh, Deputy Director of the ERA and Innovation um, uh, Directorate, we are looking at uh, uh, how to make this concrete. So there is a, a, a list of ERA actions that, that are elaborated. There was a first wave in 2023, and now there is a new wave of actions that are preparing for 2024. And this type of conclusion, uh, we try to make them become practi practical. So what I just said, the network co coordinators, the best practices, and the science for policies code of practice. So these are all a uh, list of these projects that will have to be adopted then in 2025. But I think it's very important to see that we are going in this direction. There is not the only things we are doing, but I think this is a, the over, uh, overall framework on which we will be moving forward in the future. So it's quite important. Thank, thank you very much. Um, Maria Chiara, Magda just, just um, implicitly men mentioned the, the elephant in the room, which is, of course, the COVID pandemic. And I think in, in Italy, it was not only a wake-up call on the side of realizing that science could play a bigger, bigger part, but also in terms of the national recovery plan, the, there's actually quite some restructuring going on in the science area, and specifically in that direction, science for policy. Could you say a few words like how the experience has informed the, the actual restructuring and where you are heading currently? Yes. Um, I, I try to be, uh, to summarize all uh, I know. effort that we are uh, now devoting to, to develop also the capability of, of uh, reacting with uh, uh, science positions. Uh, first of all, we are developing a new academy of uh, engineering and applied science, uh, which is uh, more dedicated than the Academy of Sciences in Italy. Mm, this Academy of Engineering and Applied uh, Science is uh, more dedicated to technology and uh, the relationship with uh, uh, industry, but also the production, for example, for vaccines, uh, how to produce and to uh, elaborate the uh, value chain for producing this or, for example, the different acts that uh, at the level of European Commission are related to uh, developing uh, microelectronics, for example, or raw materials capability and all issues that at the level of European Commission are, are faced. So it's important that we reflect in Italy on how this has, has an impact on Italy. And so this is the reason why with many scientists we are developing this academy which is more dedicated to policy advice and uh, second we are implementing this mechanism in order to be autonomous and, and independent and this is realized by having a sort of independent academy which is composed of scientists uh, not receiving funding from the government and on the basis of sharing with the uh, ideas with the consensus meeting 
and, and so we have different positions integrated together. Okay, so it's not possible to, to mediate on the different perspective that we can have and the different interests that the advisor can have. Okay, okay, because advisors are human, so the only way is to share different perspective and try to find a sort of point of. Uh, of consensus and then share together. This is important. And then, and third, we are um, also uh, developing the national recovery plan, which is, has a huge investment in research. So the idea is to shift from the model of uh, uh, efficiency and uh, uh, the, the economy of efficiency and growth to the economy of resilience. So developing resilience means that we are investing in the recovery plan in infrastructure, for example, research infrastructure for data sharing and digital infrastructure on bioinformatics or on different issues related, for example, on medical data. Second, we are implementing uh, different actions on uh, uh, high performance computing uh, infrastructures, also infrastructures in uh, biodiversity, preservation, recovery and restoring, which is one of the main issues in the Mediterranean area, or other issues like, for example, we have an investment in uh, RNA-based uh, vaccine development and uh, Im uh, immunology-based therapy. So that means that we have a family of policies, from one side investing in developing real research centers dedicated to particular issue, which are a top-down selection from the government and the parliament, like vaccines or therapies or or or. And then we are developing this academy of uh, engineering. I have a great expectation that this will uh, try to spread this idea of having uh, informed and position papers for the benefit of society. Thank you very much. Susanna, I would like to stay a little bit with, with the pandemic question. When we spoke earlier, and this is perhaps an example where the Netherlands are not still entirely perfect, even if they come close to it. I'm half that. <laughs> Spoiler alert. No. Um, when we spoke earlier, you said that during the pandemic it became, and I, this is, this is um, about the, the taking all the perspectives in, it became totally evident that some sciences make themselves heard very well, others not psychologists, for example. Could you say a few words on this experience? Um, well, we had we had a few scientists who who were really active in in um, in involving the, the well tr trying to explain to the public what what the pandemic what it was, um, uh, what it did, and why certain measures were taken or needed to be taken, uh, because we had a part of the population that that did not uh, probably doesn't still does not believe in science, uh, so they were dispute, uh, dis, uh, dis, uh, disputing everything. Um, and one example is uh, we had a we have a, a young girl and she's a she's an influencer I think she's like late twenties, and and she said on her, on her Instagram and you know like oh I don't, I'm not going to take the vaccine you know it's useless and blah blah you know so of course a lot of young people believed her and then uh, the scientist um, who 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 went on television frequently, invited her to come to his office, you know, and he explained a lot of things to her, and that made her change her mind. Um, so, and, you know, so, so she, she, she put another post on Instagram, you know, okay, I'm going to take the vaccine and blah, blah, blah. So um, I think it helps, you know, it really, um, it's very easy to, to be against uh, things, uh, um, uh, but it's crucial that you involve the people in, in the science, and that's also um, that, that's also why they why they're crucial. And like also in the Netherlands now, we have a national um, research agenda that has been developed with scientists and with people from the population, uh, you know, with citizens together. Okay, so how can we tackle the challenges for the future uh, together? Yeah, so e excellent sure. example, I think, for how science science for policy can actually also take on this wave of stuff that is going on on social media, which we sometimes tend to sort of see as a given, but you can actually intervene. This is people, and you can talk with them. Um, Javier, when we spoke earlier, you told me about like how the COVID pandemic has changed minds also in, in the minds of researchers, not only in terms of policymakers, that we have to take on more, but also in the minds of researchers, specifically those who 
were busy rather with fundamental research suddenly realized that, yes, actually, we can make an impact on society. Could you say a few words on that? Yes, of course. Um, yes, the, uh, this is something that is common all across the world, is that the pandemic uh, made us aware of how important knowledge is, right? And it's very obvious in, in, in terms of how quickly we were able to produce a vaccine that, that basically helped very much on, on dealing with the, with the consequences of the pandemic. Uh, and that was thanks to a lot of basic research that had been conducted before. But as, as you say, for many scientists who are busy uh, doing their own research, uh, this was like a wake-up call. Okay, all of a sudden, it was very difficult for them to go to the lab, uh, those who have to go to the lab. Those who don't need to go to the lab had to work from home, and, and they were seeing you know, the world they knew threatened by, by changes. And I'm sure this put everybody in a position to think, okay, what is it that I can do to address this global challenge? And if you allow me, this is something that I think is important to, to think in the way science as an institution operates. Uh, when, when we are university students, we are driven by our motivation to knowledge on the one hand, and also to have a positive impact in the world, you know, from whatever discipline or field we are working. We think, okay, let me study this basic uh, particle of, of matter, because this is going to help us eventually maybe develop new forms of energy that will be clean and so on, right? Uh, in, in other fields, like in the social sciences, we think, okay, let me understand better a certain social process, and then we can prevent conflict or something. As we enter into the academic career, we kind of forget about this, or at least we are pushed towards leaving this aside because we are demanded so much. It's a very competitive world, extremely demanding, and we are forced to publish, obtain funds, and so on. So whatever our motivations, initial motivations were, have to be left aside. It's not, there is no question about that. And then the, the pandemic basically brought us back to the position, why do I do what I do? And everybody from their discipline thought, okay, maybe I can contribute from my knowledge in social psychology to help public administrations explain citizens better how to a pandemic works and how we need to individually behave so that coll collectively we are better uh, prepared to respond to the pandemic, right? So everybody from their discipline realized that they may have something to contribute. And when we came back from the lockdowns, all scientists were very eager to try to join in initiatives to work together with other uh, scientists from different disciplines to put up uh, initiatives and to put up recommendations to public administrations on how to address challenges. Do, do I understand you correctly that the pandemic, yes, was such a wake-up call, but climate change is not? Well, I think it is, but not so quickly, let's say, because the room for, although there is a consensus on the scientific world about climate change, but uh, in, t in terms of the policy arena, this is not so obvious. And in terms of society, there is always the, the possibility to say, well, you know, yes, but maybe not so quickly, right? So I don't think there is this urge yet to respond to climate change in the way that the pandemic put us all at home, right? The, it locks us down. Uh, now we are suffering extreme heat and droughts and f wildfires and so on, and we are concerned, but I don't think the level of, of let's say, worry is so high at the moment as to, as to equate it to the pandemic. But it's getting there, I'm afraid, mo unfortunately. Most, most of you don't live in Brussels. I came here by tram. We are mid-October and people are sitting in t-shirts in, in the tram with me. So I thought the level is pretty high. But would you share from sort of a European perspective the, the same assessment that the pandemic, yes, has changed things, climate change has not yet? in terms of perception in this, of course, we are, we are focusing here on, on science for policy. No, okay, uh, I think, yeah, it's true. Uh, you, you can see now the, the, the evidence as well of the climate change, but I think uh, COVID was such, such an impactful also in terms of images that probably created a very 
quick reactions uh, to that. Uh, but uh, there is a lot of going on also to on climate change. Uh, we have, uh, at least uh, from the Commission side, that this is one of the priorities. Uh, with a lot of actions uh, mobilizing from the R&I world is these missions as well for climate adaptation where we try to bring together different actors uh, um, and, uh, and different disciplines as well to mobilize not only the research community but also the ministries of, uh, responsible for, uh, for other areas. So I think uh, there is a lot of going on there too. Maybe the perception is a bit different, maybe it seems uh, not such a, well it's, yeah, the, 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 the impact uh, uh, yeah, of COVID was visually also quite, uh, quite, quite strong. Yeah. No, no doubt that there is a lot going on on the level of policy making of the European Commission, of course. But do you see a sort of comparable level of urgency reflected in the community of scientists? Well, it's true that probably there is a bit less, and this is what uh, on which we are working on, but I think already they provided very good examples of what is going on from that side. So, Thank you very much. I would like to shift to, to a sort of sub-question, which is, um, is policy engagement sufficiently rewarded? And Maria Chiara, when I spoke, I, I didn't have the chance to speak to you personally before this, but I spoke to one of your advisors, who if I asked him the question, well, basically answered with one word, which was no. What is wrong and what needs to be done? Uh, so I think that um, uh, we, what is wrong in, in that sense, in which sense? In, in the sense of rewarding scientists for their uh, policy okay. engagement. Um, Okay, I, I can speak food. for the National Research Council in Italy, which is uh, an institution with 10,000 researchers uh, and uh, technicians. And uh, uh, we are very much involved, uh, especially in assessment of uh, research projects and also in making uh, these kind of uh, position papers for ministries, for the parliament and similar. And uh, researchers asked for more reward for this and also to have uh, uh, the possibility of in for promotions, for example, to claim this kind of work for uh, being evaluated also for that. So, because the time they dedicated to this action is a time that is not dedicated to publish papers, for example. And so we are changing the methodologies for evaluating uh, researchers for their promotion towards the maximum level uh, which is uh, research directors in, in Italy, yeah, yeah. and uh, including the possibility of claim this activity, assessment of projects on behalf of the government, because we are involved in many of these, and also positions paper elaboration, for example, on water, for example, on uh, methodologies for desalinization, or on the many, many issues that are relevant for policymakers. And we included that with some uh, possibility, and we elaborated a sort of uh, um, resume uh, which is uh, uh, used for evaluating their career, where they can point out their activity in that sense, and also they can also point out the percentage of their time dedicated to this activity because they are called by the president for doing that, because I select these researchers for doing that, and so they can uh, be more rewarded. It's not easy, so this is a possible methodology for rewarding them, but also there is also the public um, awareness that what they are doing is uh, fundamental for uh, the society. And we also included this uh, citizen science activity, which is different from disseminations, but it is engaging citizens in understanding that their behavior, understanding that their behavior is fundamental, for example, for climate change, because climate change is something which has an impact if we engage citizens in changing their behavior, their attitude, their, their, their style of life, their lifestyle. So for that reason, we have to also reward officially for researchers engaged in this activity.
Thank you very much. And I, I have to point yeah. out another yes, different sir. issue, which is uh, yes, we are transforming uh, and emphasizing that some, some of these activities are included in science museums activity. So part of the institutes are becoming science museums. That means that uh, places where we uh, cultivate, disseminate, and uh, engage citizens in understanding the level of science and how they can be part of and this accessible science Accessible to the public. Yes. Yeah. Wonderful. Javier, when we spoke about the question of, of rewarding, you very much insisted on, on the fact of valuing the work that, that is already done. Now, Maria Chiara gave a few examples of really structural change, actually, in, in how, how scientists advance. How is the situation in Spain? Well, what I can say is that we are in the middle of a, <clears throat> a reflection process because uh, we are aware of the fact that we need to enter into a, if you want, a, a organizational culture change. We need to redefine the way in which we value the different dimensions of the work of a scientist, which is it's many. I mean, we do many different things, and they, they haven't been valued in some of them at all, and others very, very poorly. So how do we redefine this? And this is very complex. This is something we don't know how to do, first of all. We don't know how to measure, and we have been posed this question many times. Okay, you're going to value science for policy, but how do you measure that? Is it, how, is it going to be how a, a document that? you write for the European Commission? How does this score with respect to a paper you write for the, a ministry in, a, in, a, in your national government? What about when you help the local government of your town to, uh, to deal with some traffic problems or whatever, right? How do you measure that? How do you translate that? in front of other mechanisms that have been gaining, you know, respectability over the last decades, you know, like, okay, index factors and, and journals which are top and journals which are second tier and whatever, right? All of that is very mechanistic and it works well and it has helped to basically select talent within our organization. So it's a very well functioning system. So now we want to change that a little bit, not radically, but we want to introduce some changes there and it's not easy. First of all, because our scientists have been hired with different demands. We have asked our scientists, uh, this is what you need to do in order to progress. And now we are telling them this, but also that. And they're saying, okay, but I'm sorry, my, my work hours are only 16 per day, because this is what scientists work. No, not eight, but 16. So, but beyond 16, I need to see my family a little bit, and maybe a little bit of sleep. So how can I do science for policy in addition? Weekends are already burn out with uh, preparing new projects, so no time available, right? And this is a demand. Actually, I see there are questions there, and one of them is telling them, how can we do science for policy in addition to everything else we do? Okay, by valuing it. Uh, it is, but it, everybody doesn't need to do science for policy to start with. It's something you can choose to do partly, right? And, and of course, it will mean you will maybe publish two papers less in the coming three years, but it will be valued because whatever you do in science for policy will be also recognized, right? So at the end, it's about how we reach a certain balance. And on this, we are just thinking, thinking collectively. We are part of COARA, the, the coalition to think about how do we assess uh, the results of scientists, and we are just thinking about it. Uh, we don't have the answer. And the Spanish certainly have this reputation to, to can do with very few sleep, but probably you didn't reach this superhuman level to fully do without it. Um, Susanne, you mentioned already earlier in, in the very beginning the nation, nationwide program to recognize and reward researchers, which is very much tied to this, this question. How, how do we actually reward them? How can we make function the, the policy engagement next, to the, next to, to the publishing activity? It needs to take place. We, we can't do without it, of course. Can you say a few words how perhaps this is an example how, how it can work, the program? How it, how it can work? Well, we're, we're, we're also in the, in the same uh, thinking phase, uh, but we also have a few pilots. Um, like our, um, our National Research Council <clears throat> also now works with, uh, with narrative CVs. Uh, so not only look narrative, so yeah. it's more like a, like a narrative, like a story. Rather than the... F Point, 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 yeah, point, point, list, point, a complete yeah. list of all publications. Um, and also the University of Utrecht, uh, the geoscience department, also works with that, uh, with that method. Um, and that, that, those two, they, they really seem to work. 
Um, but I also, um, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's a long way. Um, and I think also what, what is crucial is that we do this together. Um, it's not one country cannot solve it all because, of course, science is international. So we need, we need the whole world on board. Um, I was in Japan a few weeks ago. And, uh, and there we also discussed uh, the rewarding of recognition. And, but you know, there's, there was a scientist uh, 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 I spoke to and, and he was very proud that he was cited 60,000 times. You know, how are you gonna change that culture? Um, so did, I, I think it's a search, it's a search. And, but the first steps have been taken, so I, I can only, you know, we, we just need to continue. Magda, th Certainly, from a European perspective, you're grappling with this question, how to measure, how to reward, to what are elements of solution, or at least thoughts going into that direction. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, again, a few activities, and it's nice because we hear first the practice and then uh, what is the <laughs> chapeau on, on it, because already as well, Javier, he was mentioning Koara, or was it you? Yeah, exactly. Koara, exactly. So, you know, this is the coalition and uh, it stems from this uh, uh, agreement to assessment of researchers, uh, and this is a spontaneous coalition, coalition of the willingness, and uh, we have uh, all the people represented here, their organization, are part of this quarter. We had 600 and uh, so more than 600 uh, signatories uh, of, the, of this uh, uh, agreement, uh, part of this coalition as well. Uh, almost all member states in Europe are, uh, are represented there. So from the research community too, there is a very important recognition and is the first, let's like, say, formal step. Then of course each member state has to see at its own ecosystem uh, what are the things that works better in one or the other. So Quara is also providing uh, the, the platform for uh, sharing the information, exchanging and learning from each other. Uh, more formally, on the 13th of July, there was a proposal for a council recommendation on a European framework for research uh, careers. And uh, this has uh, two, um, let's say, sub-elements. Uh, one is uh, the proposal for a new charter for researchers and the launch of a research, research comp is called a website. So the first one for the new charter for researchers, what is important is that there is a specific reference to the fact that we need to uh, consider the support for evidence-informed policy makers. So this is exactly to reward the researchers for this type of work that they do. And we heard today different very good examples on how to do it. But at least this is okay, a bit formalized in the council recommendation that is under discussion now. And then in terms of tools in order to implement it. Uh, this is uh, this um, uh, research comp website because uh, if we have to develop certain skills, and Maria was also mentioning that, of course, we have to list uh, what are these competencies. Now, a researcher does not need to, uh, to have all these competencies, so uh, we are not expecting that they go through everything. They will have to, to and also depends on who they give advice to, in which type of, uh, if it's legislative, it's more policy making. So this will be something that needs to be taken into account, but at least there will be this list of competencies that uh, researchers can look at and to see whether they have this type of skills, the ones that is requested, and also for universities or other institutes to see whether they have to add it to the curricula and they can do something about it. Thank you very much. I wanted to shift to the question of desirable policy changes now, but I see we only have a little more than... 15 minutes left, so I would like to open to questions from the audience. And before the microphone, the lady here in the front row, please. And um, before the microphone reaches her, I immediately start with one question which has been coming in on Slido to Maria Chiara Carozza. How do these activity academies differ or add to the function of universities? The academies you, you mentioned um, earlier. Yes. First of all, academies are community of scientists coming from universities, of course. Universities, research centers, and also uh, private research centers in yeah. industries or, or similar, or in foundations. So it's very, academy is something which is uh, very free, it's based on competence, it's not based on uh, bureaucratic uh, selection. And, uh, and so it's a sort of added value compared to university. 
and uh, is composed of people sharing an interest for science and also having demonstrated uh, high performance in science, even in uh, private funded uh, research centers. And uh, the idea is that academies are free, not uh, the, the pressure from lobbies must be um, okay, overcome by this academy by um, putting people uh, free of sharing ideas and different positions and often uh, not really um, in the mainstream, okay? So it's uh, a place where people is free to speak and autonomous from pressure and uh, in principle sharing ideas and discussion for preparing position paper and uh, mediating from different perspectives. Thank so you very much. It's part of a system. Okay. It's, it's part and it's, it's an add-on. Uh, so we can speak, uh, to explain, we have, uh, now we have science ecosystem. So in the yeah. science ecosystem there are universities, there are research centers, there are foundations, non-profit foundations supporting research, there are private centers, in, for example in pharma or in other areas, supporting research for their research and development. So academies are a sort of integration of different places where research is done. Thank you very much. And has the microphone reached you? Yes. Hi there. Thank you to the panel for your uh, thoughts on communication, reward and recognition. I'm Dr. Nusha Panjwani. I'm a virologist who's converted to the world of uh, research funding and networking, uh, as well as policy making. I'm still trying to make up my mind whether that's a brave or sensible decision. Um, but my question is, uh, so I served on the British government's uh, task force in my former role on COVID-19 vaccine procurement, and uh, it was a fantastic opportunity as a virologist to even clarify basics like what is a virus, what is a, a bacteria, how can RNA help, etc. But like with the uptake of most things, regardless whether it's an iPhone or a vaccine, of course it's comparing a private to a public uh, commodity, we see a bell curve. So we see the progressives, uh, we see uh, the major part of the bell curve that is uh, people who eventually uh, become converted. And then you always see laggers, uh, so-called laggers. Uh, there's an obvious case for focusing on the progressives and the people who fall into the majority of the bell curve uh, for the benefit of society. But I was curious to know uh, your thoughts on, is there ever a case, regardless of whether those laggers are citizens, people in public administration, academics, is there ever a case to give up, so to speak, uh, on, on the laggers from a benefits, uh, cost-benefit ratio analysis? Thanks. Susanna, maybe? How Simple, you cannot afford to. The yeah. citizens, you know, you, you need to include them. One way or the other, you have to be creative, and you know you you have to. You you cannot ignore them. Yeah, this is from the policy perspective. You, you're nodding. Okay. Um, any any other question? Yes, in the middle. And there are two microphones. All the better. Hello, my name is Juliane Schlierkamp. I'm a researcher at uh, Fraunhofer INT, and I'm researching on how bibliometric data may be used to analyze the knowledge transfer at the science policy interface. And I have a remark to what uh, Susanna Karl says, said. You said that researchers are proud of the numbers of citations. And when citations are measure what they definitely are, then to make it more attractive for researchers to um, do science for policy, I think two things should be done. The first thing is that we need more and better referencing of um, scientific uh, publications and policy documents so that you see that the um, science is considered in the policy document and then we would need to focus more on um, alternative me measures as at metrics to um, measure the success of science. Broad question, yes. Yes, um, um, I, your first suggestion, thank you for your question. Your first suggestion we'll, take, we'll definitely take on board uh, and see how we can uh, improve that. Uh, because I, th 
in the Netherlands, very often it's just, you know, like, like there's, there's a letter that's being sent to the parliament and there's like one quote that is, a, or like one footnote that says, oh, this is a research paper. But I think we could, we, I, I like your idea. So I'll, we'll take that on board. Um, and the other one, yeah, measuring a societal impact. I think it's the, the, the same challenge that we, that we face with the rewarding and recognition. How do we measure that? And, uh, and also here, we're still thinking. And um, uh, um, I also, a lot of people talk about it. And I, I sometimes I just have the, the tendency, why don't we just start a pilot and start somewhere and just test and see how, how it works and how we, how we can measure it. Um, but it's, it's just very difficult, but working on it. Yeah. Thank you. I want to add something. Uh, I think that uh, scientific societies uh, must be in involved in this mechanism because scientific societies uh, collecting people from different countries in the same area are fundamental, for example, for guidelines. So in clinical medicine, all therapies that we uh, uh, take in hospitals are based on guidelines that are the, the result of consensus meeting in scientific societies or in similar. So we can implement a similar <coughs> sorry, methodology also for science and for other areas of science. And uh, so academies and also scientific societies are fundamental in, in this process, sorry. No, it's, oh my God. If I may add something in the middle as we solve the water yes, problem. Please. Uh, please do. I think that metrics in general have served us well for a long time in terms of providing us very rigorous and serious uh, information about the quality of scientific results. But also, at the same time, I'm, I'm sure you all know that in recent years, there has been a growing concern about some unexpected negative side effects of metrics, uh, which have created the wrong incentive structures for scientists, for uh, the predatory journals, and strange dynamics going on. So, the whole dynam dynamic of Coara is going back to, to look at this metrics element, not to, again, throw the baby with the dirty water, but just to make sure that, you know, we continue taking on board what is good from metrics and we get rid of some of the negative side effects of them and then hopefully including other dimensions in these metrics beyond, strictly speaking, citations in so it's journals. not at all about getting rid of an ancient system and replacing it, but rather adapting it to a new reality and to new challenges that come on board. Maria Chiara, now with a bit of water, your, your voice is re-established. Yes, yes. I, I still wanted to leave you finish your sentence. Okay. Yes, yes. The point is uh, that we need more uh, elaboration and we cannot use only numbers, even if numbers are fundamental. For example, in clinical trials, we need numbers in order to uh, okay, support a, a guideline for therapies or for uh, interventions. So numbers are important, but we cannot uh, on, not base everything only on numbers. And we need this uh, narrative part uh, describing how these citations, for example, or these uh, publications have been uh, made. So I think that... Uh, the science for policy mechanism is strongly correlated on to the system for evaluating and assessing scientists and science. They cannot be divided. Because if we base policy or position papers on the capability of contributing, we need also a system for evaluating uh, the origin of, of these uh, uh, position papers. So COARA is fundamental to understand that. That, that's very, that there's a sort of side aspect coming to my mind. I remember when I was at elementary school, age six and seven, I had yearly reports which were a written narrative about like how the pupil behaved in class. And then when we became sort of seven, eight, we moved to the real stuff and there were figures. And we felt like now we have a real report. But yeah. what we're talking about here is actually reversing that tendency and putting the narrative back into without replacing the, the, the metric system. Um, I have another question here coming in over Slido. How 
do the different ways of, of assessing a promotion in Italy that were mentioned relate to Coara? And this is, of course, my yeah. other question for you. I think that it is, is what I already said, that uh, assessing for a promotion is uh, something which is related to the reward for a person who is engaged in uh, supporting science for policy. So it is part of the Coara effort to include this part of the normal, ordinary job for a scientist and also to reward for this part. I think that uh, for elaborating on science policy, we need uh, good scientists, excellent scientists to be engaged in doing that. So it's not possible to have uh, people who are working for policy, uh, developing our position papers without having experience in research. So it's like education and teaching. Teaching is, not, is related to also research in Europe, our university, the von Humboldt University is based on teaching because you are also researchers. So the third part could be to prepare position papers, but it's not possible to be part of, of to do that without being a researcher. So, so we have this correlation between COARA, how we assess research, and science for policy. Thank you. There's another question coming in on slide. Are the comments relating to the need for robust public engagement in garnering overall support for science for policy are very welcome. Can the speakers give example of key approaches? Magda, perhaps a question to you. Thanks a lot. Yes, it, it's yes. true. Huh? Public engagement is key. Uh, citizen engagement as well. So this has been, uh, again, it's on our radar and we try to engage as much as possible citizen. And this has been an interest as well showed by member states. We have, and this I, I have my other head of, uh, uh, head of unit for semester and country intelligence. We run the policy support facility and we have on the basis of a request by member states, we run a mutual learning exercise on citizen engagement and this is how really we can uh, mobilize a citizen to understand that uh, science is important because this then relates also to the way people are rewarding to create a new status and especially to create trust on, on science, which is uh, the other big, uh, big point. Uh, and we will follow up with this public engagement, uh, mutual learning exercise as well, uh, and uh, definitely as, uh, there will be more examples there coming from the member states themselves. So it's something key, and we are looking into that for sure. Thank you very much. Are there more questions in the room? Here in the second row, Uh, hi, I'm Nicola Magnani, DG Research and Innovation. Um, I was very happy to hear a lot of concrete proposal on how to engage more scientists into this kind of science or policy work. However, I have a little bit of a feeling that they're mostly tailored to experienced scientists. The reward for promotions, uh, acad academies, that kind of stuff. If we want to change the culture, I think we really want to bring the young scientists, the non tenured, so to speak, postdocs, etc., in early. How do we do that? <laughs> How do we do that? This is probably also a question to universities and hence, Maria Chiara, because that's one of your heads as a rector I of think university. Young, young people must be definitely in this system. First of all, what I noticed to my experience is that young people, are, they are more uh, young researchers, non-tenured researchers. They have, are more committed to do something for the society. They are more socially eng engaged compared to my generation. So it is also a way of motivating people to do science because the science that you are doing is fundamental not only for the progress of scientists and scientific knowledge, but it is also useful for doing, having an impact of society on society. If you develop a, a novel technology for batteries or uh, you uh, uh, study rare uh, diseases, you can do something which is useful not only for you but for the society. So it is this kind of reward which is part of uh, their mission, the science mission that we have today, which is fundamental to me. Not everything is related on numbers, on, on, on salary reward, but I think that uh, narrative uh, curricula and also narrative resume, as I said before, are part of this because we included in the process for promotion, also for having tenure, so the, the first level, 
a possibility of describing their program. So what is your scientific program for future? So they can include to do something useful for the society, to have an impact. And this, is, this cannot be described by numbers. Okay? It is a sort of motivation letter. A motivation letter is something which is very useful to understand why a young scientist decided to do science. So I am a believer. I think that this could be something that engage more and more young people in doing science. Thank, thank you very much. Two last questions because we're running out of time. There's one gentleman in the back here and the lady to the outer left side, exactly. My name is Nils Eksalin and uh, I'm a member of the European Group of Ethics. And I, uh, science is extremely important and we want value, be, uh, evidence-based science. And, uh, but when we design policies, it means that we take decisions and that we make recommendations, but no decision can be taken without values, and no recommendation can be uh, given without values. So my question to you is, how do we focus on the values? During COVID, it turned out that much of what was done, it was very important to, at an early stage, and at the same time as the science was produced, we discussed the values. So I think you have talked on the topic of this uh, meeting, but I would like to see a conference on science and values for policy in Europe. So where are the values? Javier, perhaps? If yes, I may jump in. It's a huge topic. Uh, yeah. The first thing that comes to my mind is that what we have been discussing here is the supply side. Uh, is what science can provide to public administrations, to decision makers. Uh, we are not naive. Uh, whatever we provide to policy, policy makers is not going to be bought by them automatically. It's just going to be one element into a much broader equation that they will take into consideration when deciding. They may completely ignore what scientists have told them because they have other priorities. They have constituencies and they have values. They have ideologies. They have plenty of uh, inputs they will introduce into the equation. We are just providing one. Uh, a second part of my answer is we could also imagine philosophers and other uh, people from the humanities also providing science for policy advice to policymakers regarding the implications of whatever decision. And again, it will be part of the pool of the supply that we scientists can actually provide. But again, uh, values are at the very core of decision making for policymakers, even if uh, for different reasons we are imagining having to do more with their own worldviews and, and their own set of uh, ideological uh, parameters. But yes, we can also include that within the scientific uh, input, if you and, want. And there's certainly a historic example which we very much cherish, which is Greek democracy, where the philosophers had a prominent place, of course. And there is one last question over there. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it was about the, the impact factor in the publications of uh, scientists. So uh, we have the impact factor. We have also this attention factor, the uh, metric that uh, shows like, how many uh, tweets or retweets uh, have, uh, have been done with your publication. Uh, also Mendeley uh, policy source, if any policy source have been mentioned in your publication. But uh, for allowing research to see the light faster and be in line with the policy makers and the policy, um, yeah, uh, publications, how difficult would it be to create a new index uh, measuring or showcasing the real impact factor <laughs> in showing uh, the real uh, policy factor or change factor and then perhaps, I don't know, even having, because the risk that sci scientists have is to, okay, if we show our data uh, earlier, then we won't be able to publish it, uh, it won't be accepted. Uh, would it be possible to have a journal on science for policy, for example, or something that uh, the results could be shown or used beforehand, but then um, give scientists time to to continue the or finalizing the um, the publications, and then really uh, make this something important, uh, uh, 
in, in the scientist uh, groups and policy makers that this is something good to have as an impact factor. I mean, like the, the real impact factor. So double, double question there. And, in, and in sorry. In quick in index. To, sorry, but also about the ethics, because uh, that's something, the ethical approval is something that uh, usually takes so long time. So like, it's not only the researchers that have to do it faster, but then also the ethical approvals. Like, how can, can we do this quicker? I guess we don't have the time to go everywhere now, but there is still time. Of course, there's a coffee break afterwards. Do use it to discuss the remaining questions. Question of index. I have a very quick question, answer to that. Recently, I was in a meeting in which there were several experts on bibliometry, and they quickly aligned in two different groups, orthodox and heterodox. Uh, and the orthodox were saying, we have very clear parameters, and the heterodox were saying, not really, because actually those are okay, but we can complement these with another range of indicators that could complement the previous ones. And that is a debate within that particular world. Of course, we prefer, up to now, more strict, rigorous parameters, but there are others uh, that are already being discussed within that particular uh, discipline, uh, which could, in a way, enrich the strictly speaking citations uh, reports. And is there any thought on this tricky question of when to give the information away, publication or giving towards policymakers? Maria Chiara? Uh, I think that uh, publications are related to peer review and to uh, the assessment of methodologies and of data, so it's difficult to overcome a publication because uh, it is the methodology that is used in science based on peer review for evaluating the work that uh, has been done. So I'm not very much in favor of research papers without peer review. So this is the reason why I support scientific society and peer communities where science is evaluated and recognized as a piece of science. Thank you, Susanna. Last word, very, very short. Uh, as a policy, as somebody who works at a ministry, um, if you if you, if you would be hired to do an assignment, I would say come with results as quickly as you can because then more quickly we can take it uh, up in, in our policy making. Even, you know, of course, but all the, all the, the, the bits and the buts, you know, it, even if you're halfway there, please show what you have. And if you're, and if you're doing it by yourself, but you think it's interesting uh, for the government, please knock on our door, please do. We can use it, thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for all the panelists.